Do I, you want me to call you Russ or Russell? Russell. Or actually, I'd rather you call me Mr. Jabbers. But... <laughs> okay, Mr. Jabbers. No, right. yeah. <laughs> hey, this is Dan from Music Explorer. We're here today with Russell Jabbers. Russell is best known for being Billy Joel's rhythm guitarist from 1976 from the Turnstiles album all the way through the 1986's The Bridge. In 2014, Russell was inducted into the Long Island Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with Liberty DeVito and Richie Cannata. Since then, they formed their own band, the Lords of 52nd Street, celebrating the music they made with Billy Joel. Hey, hey Russell, how you doing today? I'm good. How you doing, man? Pretty good. Pretty good. So, uh, I guess you got a great career. I mean, uh, you know, with Billy Joel and then playing with the guys in Billy Joel, and now you also have your other band uh, with the, remain, the other members, uh, the Lords of the 52nd Street. So, I guess let's start out with your influences when you started out playing guitar. Well. I, I, I guess I have the same story that every musician I've ever met or talked to has, but when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan, it was over for me, I, you know, and, and to me, all I ever wanted to do from that point on, even though I was already playing a little bit, you know, but from that point on, I just wanted to play rhythm guitar in a kick-ass band, and, and that was it, and John Lennon was my idol. And then later, Keith Richards was equally an idol. And I love that those two bands, because I, I, I really started off as this, you know, writing songs. And I love how those two bands followed the rhythm guitar player as opposed to the rhythm section. And so, I mean, everybody follows Keith. And when you know, John writes a song, that, that becomes the nucleus. So that was, you know, that was it for me. It was over. And I, I guess you probably heard that story a hundred times from I've, everybody who's been to the interview. Yeah. There's a lot of folks that say that, yeah. So I noticed you did say rhythm guitar, so you weren't interested yeah. in being a lead guitarist? Honestly, I I never even thought of myself as a guitar player. I, I mean, I, I thought of myself as a guy that, that put some songs together and I got my friends together to help visualize those. And I was very, you know, I knew exactly what I was looking for. And I was really lucky that the guys that we got together with to do that, uh, I was really blessed that you know, it was Liberty and it was Doug Stegmeier and it was um, Howard Emerson back in those days who played on turnstiles and he's an amazing guitar player. And uh, he loved the idea. It wasn't about doing solos. To me, you know, that always kind of bored me. I, you know, when, when there's a free pool, uh, freeform jam or something, I could care less, honestly. I, you know, I love the, a solo that's like a composition. When you hear something that's classic and it fits the song, I'm all about the songs and framing the songs. So, and that's where my interest lied. And I've been blessed to play with, with guys that can really shred and play, you know, amazingly, but that was never my interest. So, I mean, so then you guys all met together. I mean, you and Liberty and Doug met, mm -hmm. and then you formed a band. So what happened after high school and then... Uh, well, this was even before high school. I, I, I met Liberty when I was like 14 or 15 years old. And I used to go to this club in Plainview, New York on Long Island called My House. And they had two house bands. And one house band was called The Hassles and Billy was in that band. And then the other house band was the New Rock Workshop. They played on different days. And there was a guy in one of those bands. And I said, oh man, that's the guy. I'm gonna start a band with him. Funny enough, it was Liberty it, you know, <laughs> th that I focused on in those days, because Liberty was always Liberty. He was like, you know, he was the man. He, to me, he was a cross between Ringo and, and a real street tough, like a Jim Capaldi kind of guy. And I thought he was amazing. Billy was great, but he wasn't Billy yet. You know, he was still finding his voice. So, and you could tell he was super talented, but he became Billy as time went on. But Liberty was always Liberty. And I had already known Howie and was playing together with Howie. And we got together and we just, you know, played and played and played. And uh, one club owner said, right before we went to go play with Billy, he goes, you're the worst band that ever played here. He goes, you know what? He goes, Tuesday night, I need a band with, you know, um, I'm gonna promote it, but you gotta change your name. Nobody will come. I said, I got a great idea for a name. He goes, what is it? I said, just call us Free Buffet. So, um, <laughs> so he called us Free Buffet and Liberty just wrote Free Buffet on a piece of loose lip and, and <laughs> taped it on the drum. And sure enough, the place filled up, but you know, they, they hated us even more because there was no food, but then to play with Billy. But Billy got a band that respected songs that, you know, kind of went from the outside in, loved the Beatles, loved all those influences. So we just, you know, we just dug in with Billy. Right. You gelled. <laughs> huh? You gelled. You gelled. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. 
didn't mold. So then I guess Doug went out, was out in California and working with Billy or what happened there? So, D- so Doug left. Now, now everybody's doing other things at the same time. Lib had another band. Doug and Lib were playing weddings. They, you know, they, I mean, everybody's just trying to survive. So Doug went and did a tour with Billy in California. And then at that point, Billy said, you know, I want to come back to New York. And, you know, he was losing it for the California thing. And I want a real New York band because I want a New York drummer. I want a New York drummer. And, and Doug says, I know just the guy. So they go and they laid down a bunch of tracks for turnstiles with just Lib and Doug. And then he goes, I need guitar players. He goes, oh, I know the guys. <laughs> Doug, Doug called me and Howie in. And, and then turnstiles, you know, there was no producer. Billy, you know, was the producer, but nobody, you know, told anybody what to play. And then they brought Richie in. And what did, what was your feelings when you, when you got invited to play on turnstiles? What it was turning into? What were you thinking? Was that going to turn into a big hit? What were you thinking about? Oh, that? no, we were just doing it. I mean, uh, it, it was, well, it, the funny thing is we walked in and here's Billy and there's all these great songs. And it's like, you know, so it was really interesting. And then that tour was really special. And then, and that turns out store, we went to Australia, where we, you know, we were opening up. For, well, we, we were opening up for some people. We playing little venues. There's no money. There was like, you know, it was like you're just starting out. But in Australia, we had like a number one record. It's like, whoa, this is pretty cool, you know. And what was also interesting is watching Billy, who had the eye of the tiger back then. <laughs> really transform into Billy, you know, into, uh, you could see how methodical he was about it. It's like, you know, like he'd tell a little story before a show and maybe the timing was off and then he'd work on it and stuff. Every little aspect of it, 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 it sounded so natural, but believe me, he worked hard at doing that. He, you know, it was really fun to be in that situation and watching this all, you know, come together around me, I mean, it was like pretty amazing. Did you, did you guys feel that at that album was a turning point for Billy's? I thought that, you know, as much as I, I, I listened to all the early albums, you know, obviously great songs. I remembered Billy as the rock and roller and, you know, in, 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 in the My House. And he kind of, to me, sounded, and though, you know, the, the original uh, records like Cold Spring Harbor and, um, and the others, great songs, but I didn't feel, it sounded like a bunch of LA guys playing on it, like session guys. I didn't feel the power that you could have like you, you hear other people do Beatles songs and they don't sound like the Beatles, you know? It's like you have to have that something extra behind it to take a great song and make it, you know, explode. As and a I band, felt, as a band well, Yeah, you know, but not every great record it, it, it is by a band, but it's, it's certainly having that respect for the artist and that respect for the song. And it's hard to get a bunch of guys together. The e Street Band is like that with Bruce. When they when they all click in, you know, some of the greatest shows I ever saw were some of Bruce's shows, and it's like, wow, you know, these guys get it. It's you really know. cool, right? <laughs> yeah, Thanks. it's amazing to you know to be. To me, it always felt like like I'm a, I'm a Yankee freak. So um, and it always felt like you know, wow, I'm playing on the Yankees. You know, it's like I felt like I was you know the second baseman for the Yankees when I played with Billy. It's like this is pretty cool. We're going to the World Series. So, I mean, you had a, that was a great. I mean, the seventies. I mean, it just escalated and escalated. So it just you know, yeah. you see, what did you think there was an uh, glass houses? I guess really set you guys over the top. I guess, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I never thought about it. You know, it was like I, here I was. I felt like I was really lucky to be doing something so interesting and exciting with my friends. You know, and it, and it just felt like you know, it, it 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 was just I can't put it into words. It was that part of your life where it's almost surreal that you're you know you're going on that path and you're um, you know I loved every second of doing that. That was it, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I remember some turnstiles. I mean, those albums just went straight up the charts. I mean, there was no turning back. Yeah, I, you know, I think the first number one record Billy had, not just the way you are, was still rock and roll to me. That was the right. first number one. Right. And, you know, so it was at the beginning, Billy and the press kind of had this odd relationship. You know, it's like it was, uh, it, it took a while for them to embrace what we were doing now. I mean, Billy's like the biggest thing there is, you know, but but at the beginning, it took a while for that to take hold. And, you know, credit to him, he worked his ass off to make that happen. It was like, you know, you can't, you can't buy your way into that. You gotta 
go out there and play every night and go like it's the last show you're ever going to do and knock right. people out and word them out. And all of a sudden, this thing grows and grows and grows. And have a good Easter right, buddy. Good weekend. And Cheers, you too. Thank you. Thanks.